Spotlight is a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. It seeks to spotlight people, places, and events from around the Diocese of Youngstown that promote the new gospel of joy called for by Pope Francis. Your program host is Father James Corda. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. We are going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown during this series. And joining me now is Father George Belasco. Welcome to Spotlight. Oh, thank you, Father Jim. Good you to know, be I, here. I think it would be good for the folks that are with us to know how you uh, fit in to the Diocese of Youngstown historically. Uh, you were a young child um, when the diocese still was not a diocese. We were still part of Cleveland. So tell us a little bit uh, about that. Well, a little bit of our history in this sense is that uh, my family really belonged to St. Peter and Paul's because we we're Croatian extraction. And then when mom was going up to St. Peter and Paul's, the priest at Immaculate Conception said, why are you going all the way up there? You know, we have a parish here. It was an Irish parish as such. So for the last three of the 10 children, uh, we were part of Immaculate Conception. My sister Mary, you asked about her, uh, myself and then my younger sister, uh, Trudy Helen, in the sense were brought up in the parish of Immaculate Conception. We were part of the Cleveland Diocese at that time. And so my history in the sense starts at that time about the year 1940, I'm in Immaculate Conception School, mm -hmm. and basically I started at six, or, you know, and then, uh, how was it, five, and then six, you got into the first grade. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit uh, age-wise. But what I found interesting in the sense there, being in that parish, I was confirmed in 1941 mm -hmm. by Bishop Schrems out of Cleveland. We're yeah. still the clean part of the Cleveland Diocese. Mm -hmm. And I was confirmed before I received First Communion because I was not old enough to receive communion yet, First Eucharist. But as I was talking now before the set itself, that's the proper way of doing it. You're supposed to get baptism, confirmation, and then Eucharist. Okay? That's another show, Father. Okay, George, but so, the okay. idea, yes. that's part of my history sure, in this sense. Sure. And then in 1948, uh, uh, basically, I graduated from Immaculate Conception School, and then I went on to East High School. Mm -hmm. now, that, was, that was the other Catholic school. You had Ursuline, and then most of the kids at East High were Catholic also. Sure. But the idea would be that my home base was at the Immaculate Conception Parish. I would serve there, many confirmations in the sense and other things I would be serving at Immaculate Conception. And that's what I remember about that early history of the church of under the Youngst uh, Cleveland Diocese before we became Youngstown in 1943. Uh, right. right? C could you remember back then as a, young, a youngster in school when the diocese was actually uh, created? Do you remember anything about that? Or were you still like too young to remember well, that? Well, probably, it probably didn't affect us too much because th many of the priests that were with us were out of Cleveland. Like Father McCann was sure. basically a Cleveland boy in the mm -hmm. sense that was pastor of the Immaculate Conception. And probably we didn't pay that much attention to it that we were part of the Cleveland diocese except that I know that Bishop Shrimps confirm me, and that's coming from the Cleveland Diocese. They wouldn't get McFadden until 1943. Now, did you remember McFadden at all? In a certain sense, yes. I probably knew his secretary better <laughs> because, do you remember the license plate for Bishop McFadden? No, uh, I don't. I think it was uh, M1 or something like that. Okay. And of course, uh, his secretary was Monsignor Prokop. From Monsignor Prokop. Yes. And so basically I knew Monsignor Prokop better than, because he would be the force coming in to let us know that the bishop was coming. So he would be the sure. master of ceremonies and all that. So I probably served maybe a confirmation or two under uh, McFadden and also uh, in some way in the sense was aware of, you know, that experience of the Diocese of Youngstown, but didn't really in influenced me that much of what it meant. In what year were you ordained to the priesthood? 1967. And tell us about your uh, experience at that time, uh, who was bishop and what you remember. At that time, uh, the bishop who replaced Bishop McFadden was not doing too well. And I was actually ordained by Bishop Malone, who was the auxiliary, all right? And so I remember going up to the hospital to see the bishop I'm talking about. Who, Walsh. Bishop Walsh, okay. Yes. And reminding him that we were still his boys, okay. Sure. We gave him our 
priestly blessing there mm -hmm. after being ordained to the mm -hmm. cathedral. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a little older guy at that stuff because I was already into the service for two years. And so I was up uh, 33 when I was ordained. So okay. I was much older than the other guys in the class. Okay. So a lot of your uh, history in the Diocese of Youngstone would probably be similar to mine. And I, I will, will have been ordained 39, 40 years. So mine is with Bishop Malone. He also ordained me um, a priest. So what is your experience in the last few minutes of our first segment of Bishop Malone? Bishop Malone, I thought, in a sense, was a, a very creative in the sense, very strict in a sense, but on the other hand, in the sense of being open to a lot of things that were going to happen because he took part in Vatican Council too. Mm -hmm. And so basically, I think, you know, I only knew Bishop Malone uh, basically on a one-to-one -one better than uh, the other bishops and even some of the other priests in the sense that we would just be under. Father McCann was the pastor forever mm -hmm. at Immaculate Conception before... Uh, he passed. Yeah. And of course, we know the folks that uh, are with us know you very well as uh, being instrumental in Jewish Christian dialogue. And in our next segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But let's begin uh, by the end of this segment to talk about Vatican II and then its impact in our church. Well, I think it has a strong impact because basically we came out of the seminary strongly uh, in, how would you say, ingrained with what were the teachings of Vatican Council II. Mm -hmm. And Malone was there, remember, he took part in the uh, mm -hmm. Vatican Council II Council, uh, uh, participating there. Mm -hmm. And if you might remember at that time, because they didn't know if they would be coming home for ordinations in May, they had ordination at that time, probably around December or January before they went back to the council. And so a lot of our priests at that time were actually ordained at that time because mm -hmm. the bishops may not be back in the diocese for ordinations in May. Yeah. Did you uh, ever get an opportunity to go to those uh, sessions where when the bishop came back to the diocese, they had uh, training sessions on Vatican II? Very Do you much so. you recall those? Yeah, because I'm already ordained. Okay, I'm 1967, mm -hmm. so that's about 69. And so basically I was very much in part of that because in the military I was trained in adult education. I taught at the Southeastern Signal Corps School, so I wasn't afraid of adult education. That was a more priority for me than teaching the kids, okay? Because mm -hmm. I, I was the discipline for the kids. I couldn't get them to sit down and keep quiet and all that. Had my days up at Ursuline and also Mooney. I would rather have adults. Sure. Uh, and so basically, yes, we were, and I started a program with the diocese as I was on that committee, that because of the upcoming Sunday readings, he didn't have time to explain them on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I started classes of to study the upcoming Sunday readings in their depth. And I had different centers around the diocese I would do that. Mm -hmm. I actually self-appointed me as a doll educator and basically that doesn't come officially until much later in my ministry, so. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, so please stay with us, we'll be right back. After the Catholics of Warren stopped meeting in their homes and organized a structured parish, they used a former Episcopalian church for their worship. St. Mary's Mission was established in 1837, yet the first resident pastor did not come to the parish until 1868. Other parishes quickly grew up in Trumbull County, including St. Stephen Niles in 1853, St. Patrick Hubbard in 1869, St. Vincent de Paul Vienna in 1871, now called St. Thomas the Apostle, and St. Rose Gerard in 1892. The other 15 parishes in the county were established after the turn of the 20th century. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. In 1850, a Catholic mission was established in Conneaut, making it the first organized Catholic presence in Ashtabula County. It wouldn't be until 1864 that an actual building was purchased to serve St. Mary Church. Eight years before the construction of St. Mary's Parish Church, St. Joseph Church in the city of Ashtabula was established. Parishes in Conneaut have aligned under the title 
of Corpus Christi Parish, and in the city of Astabula as Our Lady of Peace Parish. There are 11 other parishes in that county that serve over 20,000 Catholics. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm talking with Father George Belasco. <clears throat> I'd like to begin this segment, uh, Father George, by reminding the folks that are with us that you and I have uh, a history also. Uh, you were uh, ordained in the year you had mentioned. I was in eighth grade at the time. I served your first mass. You show up and, in the pictures. Uh, yes, and I just remember uh, being with your family during that celebration and what a wonderful time it was. And I think it was an influence on me in um, my thinking about becoming a priest. So I want to thank you for that. Well, hey, that's God, how God's grace works. It wasn't, it wasn't my doing. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I remember is, as a young priest that you were considered the adult education specialist in the diocese. So uh, when we ended our first segment, you were talking about um, adult education and how important that is, uh, not only uh, in the diocese, but in the church in general. But then you became very uh, instrumental in Jewish Christian dialogue. So let's talk about that during this time together. When did you actually begin that? When did you initiate that? I probably started with um, St. Joe's in, in, uh, in uh, um, a, yeah, uh, Alliance, Ohio. Okay. I think I scheduled a Seder <laughs> meal and talked to the Jewish community in Canton. And they came to a Presbyterian church, I think. But it's not strongly yet, you know. In fact, I had to go down to see Father Maley to how to deal with Jewish Christian studies. Mm -hmm. And he said, George, he said, the best thing you can do is try to make them, the, let them be the best Jew that they can be. So he's already implementing Nostra Aetate right after Vatican Council mm -hmm. too, and that's in the back of my head that I'm not there to convert them. But it all happened at St. Pat's and Hubbard. Okay. They have a very holy day that they call a festival. <laughs> and they had to park my car in front of the old church and somebody went through the red light and wiped me out. I was scheduled at Youngstown State University to talk on death and dying because my dad had just passed mm -hmm. and we knew, used the new burial rite from the uh, Vatican Council okay. II, which was a little bit different than the old way. Mm -hmm. And so basically Sister Susan Shorston, who was uh, the uh, head of the uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, was running a course at Youngstown State on death and dying. Mm -hmm. So she invited me to come in with the new burial rite. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Meyer was called in from the Jewish community who was Temple Alamet from the north side of Youngstown. Protestant minister was invited, but he didn't show up. So basically, sister said, I could take you there, but I can't pick you up. Mm -hmm. So after we did our course and met Rabbi Meyer, being the Protestant minister was there, we got together, we made up what the Protestants do with burial rights. <laughs> and so he says, I, I need a ride back to Hubbard. And he says, I live in Liberty. And so basically he took me home. And when we were talking on the way back, we started to decide, maybe, you know, let's get together. We can do some things together. He yeah. said, well, come up and see me. Mm -hmm. And that was how I met Rabbi Mar. And that's 44 years ago. All right. mm -hmm. We're coming up to 45 years of right. that. Mm -hmm. And tell us about the experience of Jewish Christian dialogue. We know that you had gone to several parishes around the diocese where you had gatherings of folks that became very um, uh, interested and, and your faithful followers in understanding Jewish Christian relations. But then you also had an opportunity to take those groups to uh, Israel. Talk about some of that experience of traveling in the Holy Land. Okay, well, uh, Basically, we have to touch another, uh, Monsignor Gino Baroni uh, who came into the diocese and he brought the, uh, to our minds that you have to understand your own culture before you can understand other people's culture. So when I started to appreciate that, as we look at the black community, mm -hmm. then what was it like when Jesus was growing up? You know, he's not Croatian, he's not Italian, he's Jewish, is Jewish, okay? Mm -hmm. So basically, I started to reflect on that. And so basically when Rabbi Meyer and I got together and started doing, we first called it Jewish Christian Studies uh, 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 Dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now it's called Jewish Christian Studies because we can go deeper than this right. in the sense of just not surface mm -hmm. uh, goody good type things, okay? 
And so basically, when I met him, like 44 years ago, mm -hmm. the next year, 1976, we took our first trip to Israel mm -hmm. as a Jewish Christian group. And I remember, I think maybe in our second trip, the guide said to me, pulled me aside and said, Father, he says, if you come alone, I can do more with you in the sense of, of taking to different places. And I said to myself, yeah, then we're going to lose out one third of the trip because basically we won't be going to the Jewish. Sure. Uh, and so with that, we did four trips to Israel and we did one trip to Rome in Italy mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. sense with Jewish Christian studies. Mm -hmm. And the groups were around 40, you know, and, and, and they were mixed. They were uh, not only Catholics and Jews, but they also had some uh, Protestants that would join uh, in, in these tours. So. Again, we can't, that'd be another program to go through all those tours because we did the program here on Jewish Christian uh, dialogue here mm -hmm. for many years at uh, CTNY. Let's talk uh, historically in the last few minutes of our middle segment of the impact of Nostra Aetate uh, in the church and also in interfaith relations and dialogue and studies. Uh, how important has that been and how do we continue historically to do that? Well. Basically, again, I had to go back to Father Maley, who was our scripture uh, uh, scholar at uh, Mount St. Mary's, and I think you had him. I did. And just that input that he put in my head, and we're not here to convert the Jewish community, we're asked to make them the best Jew that they can be. So Nostra and uh, Etate was the linchpin in the sense of that document. And it was later in the Vatican Council, too, that that document came out. We just celebrated 50 years mm -hmm. of that document. And so now how do I continue to implement that? I have a little card now that I'm retired, you know, implementing Vatican Council II Nostra Aetate. Mm -hmm. So what we have decided to do now that I'm living at the villa in Pennsylvania, Villa Maria, I do have a program called Nostra Aetate. We're remembering that document and bringing in speakers mm -hmm. as a memorial in the sense because uh, the Jewish community honored me with the Guardian of the Menorah, and I promised them that I would continue to teach Nostra Aetate because of their honoring me of, of the Guardian of the Menorah. And so that's what the program is, and we have that every year now. We're into our fifth year of uh, speakers coming in to talk about the history of, you know, of the Jewish community and how it affects Christianity even to this day. In fact, Lord Schiffman is coming in this year, and he's going to be speaking about 70 years of, of the country of Israel when it was reestablished, mm -hmm. and also 71 years of finding the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so basically, I, that's my gift to the Jewish community and for us to understand ourselves. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And with you in a moment, we're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In 1847, the parish of St. Columba was established. It would eventually become the Cathedral Church when the diocese was formed in 1943. It was the first parish in the city of Youngstown and in all Mahoney County. The first church built in 1851 was to be on land in Briar Hill that was donated by David Todd, who became the first and so far only governor from Mahoney County. A second church was built in 1864, and in 1897, the third church was erected on the site of the present cathedral. A tragic fire destroyed the cathedral in 1954, but by 1958, a new cathedral was dedicated which serves Catholics today. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. The Catholic Diocese of Youngstown was established on May 15, 1943. 2018 marks the 75th anniversary of the diocese. There are six counties which make up the Diocese of Youngstown, Ashtabula, Columbiana, Mahoning, Portage, Stark, and Trumbull. There are five other dioceses in the state of Ohio, Cincinnati being the oldest, Cleveland, Youngstown's mother diocese, Columbus, Steubenville, and Toledo. Youngstown is the smallest in terms of area and the second smallest in terms of population, yet it has a third highest percentage of people identifying themselves as Catholics. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. 
By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service. Welcome back to our show. I'm talking with Father George Belasco. I think in our final segment, Father George, what I'd like us to do, uh, since we are celebrating the uh, 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown, is to recall some of those um, priests and sisters and, and even uh, lay people who have influenced you over the many years of your priesthood and also uh, your relations uh, in the diocese. Anyone particular comes to mind? When I was thinking of that question back, there's no happy memories. <laughs> they were kind of disciplined there. Father McCann was tough, okay? Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, Father Baldu, in the sense, when you went to confession to him, he would ask, are you ever going to sin again? And he wouldn't give you absolution, and he made that promise, okay? Another one that I asked, I'll mention him by name, I asked him, you know, in the Sacrament of Reconciliation, that in confession, is it a sin to kiss a girl, okay? He says, the only girl you can kiss is your mother. And the trouble is, I wasn't interested in my mother. <laughs> but again, the advice that they could have sure. given us, in the sense, because... I learned an awful lot in my first uh, years of being a priest, of asking people, of confessing. One kid said, I said, you know, I disobeyed my mother and father a million times. I said, really? He said, yes, Father, I want to cover them all. Mm. So basically with us, in the sense, we were picking and choosing, and we were frightened by that sacrament of reconciliation, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. confession, in the sense, because mm -hmm. the priest could really come hard on us. But again, I'm trying to think who would maybe influence me in that way, and uh, really, no, no one comes up in a sense, well, I, I except do. outsiders like sure. Br Gino Baroni and, and Maley and, sure. and maybe the seminary of profs in the mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And what about, let's go back to your experience um, as a, an adult educational specialist. You know, you came into contact with lots of uh, lay people over the many years. Uh, what was your experience in uh, teaching and relating to the lay people of our diocese, what kind of sense did you get from them about their life and their faith? This is going to be positive and it's going to be negative, okay? Because I was uh, comfortable in adult education, I would be sent out by the education department to have these classes for teachers mm -hmm. and those who volunteered to have our religious classes, okay? And there's two different type of people. The teachers were kind of interesting. They would register for the course, mm -hmm. then they would send their friend in the next week to sign in for them. Mm -hmm. And I just found that kind of disturbing in the mm -hmm. sense because they needed the credits to keep on, uh, have the uh, ability to teach in our uh, Catholic schools. But those who volunteered gave of their time and their effort and they weren't paid and they would show up at those classes. Mm -hmm. But I found that kind of dis disingenuous in the sense of, mm -hmm. you know, they were supposed to get the continuing ed so that they could teach it to the children and all that. For themselves first, I think, and then basically inculcate that and then to share it with those that sure. they were teaching. So basically, and I had centers all over the place. That was my position as adult educator, you know, uh, that position they gave me from the diocese. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to set up these different places. And so I would have a center in Canton. I still have one in St. Charles. I still have one in St. Pat's and Albert of doing the upcoming Sunday readings in depth, because mm -hmm. you couldn't do that at the Mass itself, right. that you would be ready for celebrating the weekend by knowing in depth those readings. Mm -hmm. And being that I was very much interested in Scripture, and still am, uh, I was, and had good teachers behind me, Jean Lavertier, Maley, Stu Miller, all these guys are on my credentials in the back. Mm -hmm. I stand on their shoulders. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not a, I would just say, a, they call me a scripture scholar. No, I've got other teachers who brought me into this. Sure. Let's go then in our last few minutes of our time together, uh, your last assignment. Your last assignment was St. Anne's Church in East Liverpool, which is no longer in existence. So tell us about that. And this is a different day and age that we live in as opposed to 75 years ago when we had an abundance of churches oh. and parishes. So what is your uh, take on where we are now in the church. 
When we were down at East Liverpool, I got that assignment coming out of Kent State. I was doing adult education out of Kent State, and they needed uh, a, a priest in the sense, let's say a celebrator up there for the students. And the, the opening happened down at St. Anne's. And Bishop alone made me administrator to go down to that parish. And I wasn't expecting to be there for the time. I spent 23 years, so almost half of my 50 years in the priesthood was down at East mm -hmm. Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And I had Wellsville for five years and basically. But then when Malone retired, Bishop Tobin came in. And then all of that sudden of, of being in a place for five years, maybe once renewable, went by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And then when Murray replaced Tobin, they forgot about that whole thing. And so I ended up retiring out of uh, mm -hmm. East Liverpool. But I was still doing adult education from, it was a good excuse, sorry I couldn't be here. I have to go to class uh, up at, uh, say, Boardman or maybe up at Kent State or something. And so basically, we, uh, you know, it was a very humbling experience to deal with the people. It was a small parish, but very active, you know, mm -hmm. taking care of the poor, feeding the hungry and all that. They were very much into the gospel itself. And way before Pope Francis said you got to smell like the sheep, hey, mm. we were smelling like the sheep. You were with the people. Huh? Sure. And so that's because of Gino Baroni, in a sense. We have to understand one another. And so basically, as I said, my last 23 years before retirement, I was with the Byzantine priest. He said, what do you mean you priests retire? I said, well, we do, you know, we do retire, okay? But the idea, we still do priestly things. Right. And I'm still doing that adult education out at the villa. And uh, this is really is disappointing. Uh, we had Jewish Christian studies out at the villa. And we had a rabbi coming in from the south side, Ovid Sedek, uh, Saul uh, Oreski. We were getting 40 people. Mm -hmm. So now we don't have a rabbi. I'm the fake rabbi. And basically we're getting 12 people. So they, so want, the the rabbi is the they want the real rabbi. Yes. They don't want a fake rabbi. Mm -hmm. But I'd use videos in the sense of, of continuing to instruct the people of knowing the Jewish background of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, I have happy memories. In fact, I've got groupies who follow me up to, uh, to the villa, especially for the, uh, the mm -hmm. vigil mass at Easter and all that. They love to celebrate with the sisters, so. Well, Father George Belasco, our time is really up. We certainly thank you for being with us today for the special edition celebrating the anniversary of the diocese and also for your many years of priesthood, but also uh, significantly working uh, in adult education and also and especially uh, with Jewish Christian studies. So thank you for doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, and I thank the people for letting me be priest. Mm -hmm. thank and thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Spotlight has been a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father James Corda.